UCP Article 3 says a credit is irrevocable even if there is no indication to that effect. So now we are talking, we have seen about the types of credits, a standby credit and a normal commercial credit. Now we are looking at what are the functions or uses or characteristics of credits. Basically, UCP 600 says a credit is irrevocable even if there is no indication to that effect. Earlier under UCP 500, the credit has to be revocable and it will be stated and SWIFT had amended their MT700 format to say whatever has been issued under MT700 through SWIFT will be automatically irrevocable. In UCP 600, there is no concept of revocability because it is straight away directly explicitly stating a credit is irrevocable whether it states so or not. So there is no need to mention the word irrevocable for a credit to become irrevocable. We can have revocable credits. If you have a revocable credit, we have to specifically state this is a revocable credit. And if it is under UCP 600 issued, we have to say how it is record, uh, revoked or when it is revoked and other terms and conditions. We have to state because UCP is meant for irrevocable credits. Revocable credits are rarely used. Why it is rarely used? Because of the risks associated with it. Because it offers no security of payment. The beneficiary cannot ship under revocable credit because he doesn't know when it will get revoked. And then well, the another risk is it may get amended or cancelled at any moment. It may get amended or cancelled at any moment means without the beneficiary coming to know that there is an amendment or a can cancellation, it may get amended or cancelled. So that is the risk the beneficiary runs in uh, entertaining a revocable credit. And it can happen at any moment before the guy mm, the shipper ships the goods or after the beneficiary ships the goods, the credit may get revoked. So he will have to ensure that the presentation is made immediately and as fast as possible because the moment presentation is made and if a nominated bank honors such a presentation issuing bank will reimburse issuing bank will reimburse a nominated bank for any honor before cancellation of standby credit and if the nominated bank says a no presentation has been made to me by the beneficiary then the beneficiary will not be able to get any benefit under the revocable credit so it shouldn't be made transferable as much as possible it should be restricted to a particular bank a nominated bank a well-known bank who is cooperative with the issuing bank so that the issuing bank knows that if there is a presentation before, before revocation, the nominated bank will come promptly and intimate the issuing bank. Then we have the irrevocable credit. Irrevocable credit is a standard credit that we normally see on a day-to-day -day basis under the UCP 600. We have an irrevocable confirmed credit. Any credit is an irrevocable credit because the promise given by the issuing bank to the beneficiary is unconditional and from the moment the promise is given, it is effective. Confirmed credit is a confirming bank adds its confirmation in addition to and separate to the confirmation or the promise of the issuing bank. Confirmed credit means at the request or authorization of the issuing bank, another bank called confirming bank adds their own undertaking to pay the beneficiary provided the same consent conditions and terms are met and same documents are submitted. So the documents required under the LC and the terms and conditions of the LC will remain same. Confirming bank will only say I add my own separate independent promise to this. So this will happen on authorization of the issuing bank or at the request of the issuing bank. How it happens in the SWIFT MT700, we have a field called confirmation instruction where the issuing bank will say may add without or with. If it says with, it is requesting the confirming bank to, it is authorizing confirming bank to add confirmation. If it is may add, it is requesting if you can add, please add. And if it is without means no confirmation is required. So this confirmation is an undertaking in addition to that of the issuing bank. Confirming the bank is not obligated to confirm. Confirming the bank is not obligated to give any reason for not adding confirmation. They are only obligated to go back to the issuing bank and say we are not willing to act as per your nomination for confirmation and so we are not confirming. They can advise a credit as it is to the beneficiary saying we have not confirmed. So this is possible. This is the confirmed credit. Then we have a transferable credit. A transferable credit is required in a situation where the, the beneficiary of the credit is not willing or able to use the credit and they need somebody else to perform under the credit and so the credit needs to be transferred. When it is required, when the beneficiary is not a manufacturer or a producer but a trader. When the beneficiary is a trader, beneficiary would need a transferable credit to be further transferred to the ultimate manufacturer or producer who will perform under the credit. It is it is also required because the traders will have limited working capital. So traders will not have bank facilities. So traders are working on thin margins and cannot afford a normal DC. And so they will not be having a, do a documentary credit issued in their name in favor of ultimate producers. But they will, whatever credits they are issuing, will be willing and ready to transfer it in favor of the ultimate producers. So when a documentary credit is not affordable and when, when there, there is not enough time to have a documentary credit issued and documents presented and then other formalities to be taken care or when there is no facility or working capital is not available to a 
trader because they are working on thin margins then a trader will ask for a documentary credit to be made transferable so that it can be transferred to the manufacturer or producer what do they get they get the security of payment the ultimate supplier the ultimate producer will get the security of payment because they are getting the credit from the ultimate buyer who is the issuer of the or the requesting issue of the credit he is applicant the the risk for the applicant on the issuing bank is that there are extra risks because multiple banks are involved there are extra costs for all the parties because multiple banks are involved multiple presentations are required why the trader supplier will use his bank the trader will use his use bank and then the applicant anyway the buyer is using his own bank to have the lcs issue so instead of two banks now we have three banks and three times the documents may get presented and so there are more chances of delay more chances of error and more chances of higher cost being incurred now we have to look at what are the definitions of the terms related to transferable credit but in a transferable credit first beneficiary is nobody but the beneficiary of the actual credit the second beneficiary is a beneficiary of the transferred credit the credit so transferred by the transferring bank is called the transferred credit a credit that is transferable is called a transferable credit and a credit the, the bank who is nominated by the issuing bank to transfer the credit is called transferring bank we need to have a specific transferring bank and a nominated bank under the credit for negotiation or honor can be the transferring bank but if it is available with any bank then any bank cannot transfer we need a specific bank for effecting transfer issuing bank can also effect a transfer of the credit so this is transferring bank first beneficiary and second beneficiary transferable credit and transferred credit now there are only certain changes permitted for example if the credit is for $100 we can have it transferred for $90 or $99 but not $101 so the amount can be reduced the quantity can also be reduced though it's not explicitly stated provided partial shipments are allowed and then the unit price if any mentioned in the credit it can be curtailed insurance will have, it can be increased for example if the if the $100 credit is transferred for 90 then a requirement of an 110% insurance can be managed only by asking for 121% from the other party so that on the on the um, uh, $90 lc that the second beneficiary receives he will have to make insurance for 120 plus or 121 percentage so that ultimately it will be 110% of the $100 lc which the first beneficiary had ultimately received and then goods description cannot be changed two things can be preponed the presentation period expiry date or the shipment expiry date and the lcp expiry date these can be preponed mm -hmm. and also the available with the bank the bank with which whom the credit is available can be transferred to the place of the second beneficiary so that the nominated bank who is now maybe transferring on at the request of the first beneficiary can make another bank a nominated bank for receiving documents under the transferred credit and then to effect payment to second beneficiary or whatever because of multiple supplier multiple countries involved multiple documents and multiple presentations multiple banks and multiple reimbursement requirements the cost the delay and the risk are too much and the applicant and the first many we have to weigh in these factors before going in for a transferable credit mechanism there are risks that the second many may directly present to the issuing bank issuing bank will anyway pay but the first beneficiary may lose his chance to draw for the difference why when we make a transfer there are two important instructions that is given to the transferring bank one of the instruction is that uh, the uh, amendments if any received can be or cannot be directly advised to the second beneficiary if can be under what circumstances if cannot be under what circumstances second inst instruction is that is there a requirement for the second beneficiary to make presentations under the credit to the transferring bank and will the first many be replacing his documents or substituting his own invoices and drafts this is required because when the second penny submits an invoice and draft for $90, suppose the first penny will substitute it with a $100 invoice and $100 draft so that when it is presented to the issuing bank, issuing bank will pay $100. The transferring bank will cut whatever is available and pay $90 less charges to the second beneficiary. So this is the process flow or this is the involvement. So based on this, the first penny may lose his opportunity to earn his portion of the income if direct presentations are made so we will have to restrict at the time of transfer saying presentation will have to be made to the transferring bank only also if a transferable credit is confirmed then the transferred credit is also automatically confirmed now we come to back to back credits back to back credit is two different lc this is also same situation where there are two sales contract between the ultimate buyer and, and between the ultimate buyer and end supplier there is one more party called the trader and there are two different contracts but the contracts are different or the terms are different or the requirements are different where and because of that we are not able to have a transferable credit also in transferable credit certain information cannot be concealed from the parties applicant may come to know about second beneficiary second beneficiary may come to know of applicant there is a risk that they may start to deal directly cutting off the first benefit from the trade 
So to overcome this risk, we go in for a mechanism called back to back trade. In this structure, the if suppose there is a credit A issued by an applicant in favor of a beneficiary, and the beneficiary will go to his bank and ask for another credit to be issued in favor of another beneficiary, second beneficiary or a, a different beneficiary, and that is called credit B. So credit B is called the baby credit or a separate credit or a back to back credit or a counter credit or whatever. Credit A, the initial credit is called the counter credit, and these two are entirely two different separate credits with two different issuing banks, two different UCPs helping two different credits. It is not a single credit but a two different credit with two different references, entirely independent and separate. So the documents received under the credit B may be used in part to make presentation under credit A. That is only support. This is only a support. This is not a security. Documents received under credit B, um, so presented by the ultimate uh, shipper or producer, can be used by the trader to be presented under credit A to the ultimate buyer. This is maybe or a portion of them may be used. The drawing under B is to be paid if compliant documents are could be presented. Under A, some payment will be received. That payment can be used to pay and um, the presentation under B. But whether the presentation under credit A is compliant or not, whether payment received or not, payment will have to be made to credit B if it is compliant. But under a transferable credit, that is not the case. The second beneficiary will not get payment if the issuing bank is not paying because of whatever discrepancy, whether the second beneficiary creates or the first beneficiary creates a discrepancy. So that's it. Now, what is the uh, the credit B is a mirror. Credit B has to mirror, being the mirror, it has to mirror the requirements of credit A. It has to mirror the terms and conditions, it has to mirror the documents required, so that the the issuer of the credit, the bank issuing the credit B will be able to submit a more or less compliant documents under credit A. If these the terms and um, terms are mirrored from credit A and the documents are also mirrored from credit A. The requester of credit B or the applicant of credit B or the beneficiary of credit A will have to submit two three things which is nothing but the evidence evidence of their ability to submit satisfactory documents under credit A their ability to convert or produce documents required under credit A out of the documents under credit B and their ability to meet with the terms and conditions of the credit A by ensuring the terms and conditions of credit B will support them in this regard Sometimes the issuing bank of credit B will ask for assignment of proceeds under credit A in favor of the transferring uh, the back to back uh, LC issuing bank. They have to give adequate explanations, assurances, or undertakings why a transferable credit mechanism is not used and why a back to back is used because this bank, the issuer of the credit B, will have to pay under this credit in respect to the fact that presentation under credit A is possible or not and whether, if possible, whether payment is forthcoming or not. Now we have something called a clean credit. A clean credit is a credit where no shipping documents are required, no, doc uh, no uh, commercial documents are required, only a bill of exchange might be there. This is nothing but the initial form of credit or a traveler's letter of credit where the bankers in the countries in which the travelers used to go used to draw bills of exchange in uh, upon or on the bank from where the traveler belongs to and that bank will be reimbursing. This is nothing but a bill of exchange getting reimbursed under the letter of credit. It's a clean credit. Advanced payment or red cloth credit. Red cloth credit is because in olden days it used to be written with a red color ink. Advanced payment credit is because advanced payment is made available under the credit. So the buyer may agree to make a part of the price available to the seller in advance or before the shipment. And this is through the DC. How it happens? The issuing bank will write in the LC asking the advising bank or the nominated bank to pay a certain portion of the LC value to the beneficiary upon certain terms and conditions stipulated by the issuing bank or may ask the nominated bank and advising bank to specify their own terms and conditions and make a portion of the money as advance. Sometimes the issuing bank will reimburse the advising bank immediately. Sometimes the issuing bank will not reimburse. But come what may, the applicant will pay only on the due date of the actual bills presented under the credit. Now for this, the issuing bank will have to authorize the bank to pay a percentage. And against what? Against the receipt. That they will they will give an evidence that they have received the funds. And they will give an undertaking that they will use the money to procure the goods for shipment or they will or maybe and also because we have seen virgules means or or and. Uh, the beneficiary will have an undertaking that they will ship the goods. Beneficiary will give undertaking that they will present the documents under the credit. Beneficiary will also give evidence of arrangements made for shipment, arrangements made for warehousing the goods, arrangements made for vessel for shipping the goods, for insuring the goods and other logistics arrangements. They will also assign the proceeds of the DC in favor of the bank that is making this advance. 
the bank before making the advance has to see whether it is workable whether the whether the beneficiary is able whether he will be able to handle this particular shipment and whether the credit terms are workable the documents and the terms so that the beneficiary will be able to present these documents within this time frame given so that the advance made can be recovered out of the proceeds payable under the presentation made the presentation will be compliant or not is a later issue now we go to revolving letter documentary credit revolving documentary credit means it revolves so if there is a long standing relationship between the buyer and seller and they are satisfied that they are they uh, about each other's standing and they are um, confirming themselves that they will have a long term trade and they are not willing to go into the formalities and procedure of uh, uh, amending the credit regularly or issuing new credits or enhancing the value of the credits then they go in for a revolving documentary credit this revolvement may be dependent on time or dependent on value what do you mean by dependent on time suppose there is a 6 month credit for us dollar 25000 face value and if it is dependent on time every month six times this 25000 will revolve which means first of january first of february first of march first of april the value available under the credit will be 25000 whether any drawing has been made or not the day because it's based on time every month a 25000 drawing is made available under the credit if it is dependent on value Every time a 25,000 drawing is made, another 25,000 is made available for drawing under the credit. Not necessarily 25,000 has to be made. If 10,000 is made, further 10,000 is made so that overall amount available under the credit is 25,000 at any point in time. If it is revolving, dependent on value. Now, there are two other ways of revolvements. If it is based on value, and if, if every day he makes a shipment of 25,000, then 180 times, because there are 180 days in 6 months, this may revolve. So, this is the risk in if it is based on value. If it is based on time, on 1st January, 1st February, 1st March, the value available under the credit will be reinstated to be $25,000 irrespective of the shipment made in the previous month which could be $24,000, $25,000 or zero. What is this automatic? The revolvement is called automatic if the, <coughs> the amount available under the credit automatically is made available and there is no need for any amendment. If it is called non-automatic, if the issuing bank authorization is required for further revolvement. So, if the bank is liable for the maximum amount, if it is automatic, which means if it is uh, 25,000 in 6 months, 150,000 will be the maximum amount that can be drawn and bank will be liable for that amount because without the issuing bank having any trigger or control, this um, available amount under the credit is automatically 25,000 every month. What is cumulative? Cumulative is if in January shipment is not made, in February it can be made for 50, in March it can be made for $75,000. This is cumulative. Non cumulative, if one month's shipment of $25,000 is not made, either completely or partially, it cannot be carried forward as next month. So between 1 and 31 of January, we can make a shipment of $25,000, but on 1st February, only $25,000 is available and not $50,000, irrespective of whether previous shipment has been made or not. So the maximum liability for the issuing bank is 150,000 and limits are normally blocked for 150,000 and all undertakings and uh, the indemnities given by the issuing bank will be to the issuing bank by the applicant will be for 150,000. What is an alternative? Now there may be a situation where instead of having a revolving credit or a partial shipment credit, the parties agree to specifically have the drawings or shipment made by installments. When the parties agree to have the drawings or shipments made by installments, that is within the given period, three shipments. Uh, once in a quarter or maybe four shipments in a year every two months or something like that then there's a presumption of cancellation of future installment drawings in a revolving credit future drawings are not cancelled only thing is the amount available is restricted to either on value or on time but in an installment shipping situation the installment shipping situation the uh, the amount available for a particular drawing if it is not drawn during the given period it will not be available for future drawings this is normally used when we have a um, supply chain running and if the goods are not available as per the schedule, further goods are of no use. So this clause will have to be disabled or ex explicitly modified in a credit saying installment shipping clause is not applicable on a revolving credit LC. But at the same time, if the if the credit is having partial shipment and if 25,000 is the face value of the credit, $1,000 per day, 25 days in a month, it is possible to make shipments and it, the credit will be available up to 25,000 for that month and the next month again another 25 will be available provided it is not cumulative. If it is cumulative, 50,000 can be drawn up for two months like that. What is evergreen and annually renewable credit? In evergreen or annually renewable credit, it can be cancelled or amended only if notice is given, which means if the credit is expiring on suppose 2020, then in 2019, 
the year 2019, a notice has to be given by the issuing bank saying this credit expiring on 2020 will not be further renewed. Only then it can be cancelled or amended. Or else what happens? In 2019, a message will go saying this credit which is expiring on 2020 has been another, extended for another one year or extended for another four years like that. So, well in advance of the current expiry, there will be a stipulated time that is 2019-2010 and this stipulated time that we have seen in the example is one year. So, notice has to be given to the beneficiary that it will be not be extended or it will be cancelled or it is being amended. This is used only in situations where the amount is not quantifiable or the time for how long the credit has to be kept open or kept valid is not quantifiable. In such situations, evergreen or annually renewable is used. Most of it is used in insurance industry when liability under the transaction cannot be easily determined. Then we have the aid agreement LCs. Aid agreement LCs is international agencies like the World Bank or International Monetary Fund or um, a development bank or international bank for reconstruction development. When these agencies, they issue something called qualified agreements to reimburse in favor of certain banks. These banks will further issue letters of intent or commitment to reimburse in favor of specific authorized banks. So what happens is these banks will say the LC has been issued under the qualified agreements to reimburse. And this is this this is issued under qualified agreements reimbursed and banks when they agree issue or advise CCLCs have to remember that these are having certain qualifications and certain conditions, restrictive conditions. These conditions will be maybe purchase or the vessel or the goods or the beneficiary or the applicant will be restricted to the donor countries. That is the thing. And second is the reimbursement will be very detailed, uh, the detailed process for reimbursement. It will be bureaucratic and very much procedural and so it may be difficult to get the payment very promptly. So these are the risks, but this will be a very high value and these are meant normally for development of third world countries.